It's a situation we hope we never have to be in. A time when all else has failed and we need to call it quits on our adventure. The time to call for help, to signal for search and rescue. Whilst it is a situation we hope never happens, here are a few tips that might just help you if you were to ever be in the need to signal for search and rescue to come and save you. It's better to have the knowledge and not use it than have no knowledge of it at all. We'll start off by looking at a few methods that you can use to signal for help when you have very little, if any, rescue signaling equipment on you. In other words, how you can use nature to signal for help. A campfire can provide you with warmth, allow you to boil water, and it gives you light in the darkness, but it can also be used to signal for help. Even just a small campfire can be utilized to create a smoke signal to search and rescue teams. Here you can see that the fire is burning well with little to no smoke and a clear and obvious orange flame. To turn this fire into a signal fire, look for green shrubs and plants in the nearby area. In this particular area of woodland, I'm surrounded by holly, but there are also a few small green ferns. I cut off the holly with my knife and then bunch up the branches on top of each other. Then I place this bundle of green holly leaves on top of the fire. Almost immediately, the fire begins to throw out a small pillar of smoke. Even just a small amount of smoke like this can be spotted by search and rescue above the tree line from a long way away. However, I find that holly, even when green, tends to burn quite fast. So what else could be used in the surrounding area to create more smoke? Given that it is currently winter and there isn't much greenery available, it's time to look at the forest floor, where there are plenty of dead leaves. The benefit here is that they are wet. If you grab a handful of leaves and put them on the fire, you'll get a much thicker plume of smoke. You can see that now the smoke is traveling much further and higher than previously. However, given the strong wind on this day, you can see it dragging the smoke horizontally. Not ideal when you need the signal to go above the trees. However, the wind isn't always a bad thing as a search and rescue helicopter or plane can get a good idea of where the wind direction is coming from and calculate a good place to land. But this is more a demonstration of how to create a signal fire this particular method in the video is a pretty rudimentary way of creating a small signal fire from your campfire. However, to make a proper signal fire, you need to be able to raise it off the ground, lash together a tripod and create a small platform for your fire to sit on. You can use the tripod to hang over branches of green leaves or conifer needles, then build a fire underneath it, light it and within minutes you will have a proper signal fire. The key is, the bigger the fire, the better the chance of smoke being seen then stand next to it, look to the skies for search and rescue, and then you can signal for help. A well-known international signal for search and rescue is both arms above your head and slightly out to your side. The aim is to create a Y shape. This is signaling to a helicopter or plane that yes, you do need help. If they have acknowledged your signal, a plane will rock back and forth, dipping its wings consecutively, notifying you that they have understood your signal. At night, they will repeatedly flash a green running light. If they have noticed your signal but they do not understand, chances are they will circle. In this circumstance, if you do not need assistance, you can put your right arm up and keep your left arm down in the shape of an N, signalling no, you don't need assistance. Around half the people in the UK who die at the coast either trip, fall or slip into the water. They never intended to get wet. This means that unless you plan to go into the water, the chances are that you'll have your clothes on. If you find yourself in this situation, you can use the clothing that you are wearing to create a makeshift buoyancy aid. For example, if you are wearing trousers, take them off and tie a knot at both ends of the trouser leg. I'm doing this while standing up to make it easier to film for you guys, but chances are you might end up doing this while treading water. Either way, it doesn't take long. Open up the waistband of your trousers and with a fast downward motion, slam them through the surface of the water to trap air. Quickly bunch up the waistband underwater and both trouser legs should now be filled with air. You can use these as a support to keep you afloat. This allows you to spend more energy on trying to wave and signal for help, rather than wasting energy on swimming and kicking to stay afloat. You can apply this same technique using your t-shirt. Tie a knot at the end of each sleeve and the neck then open up the waist of the t-shirt and pull it hard down on the surface of the water. 
it should trap a small bubble of air which can act as a buoyancy aid. It's not as effective as using trousers, but it does work. Being able to whistle for help is a pretty good skill to have. The chances are a high pitched whistle will travel further than the sound of you shouting. Now I can whistle pretty easily, but I still always carry an emergency whistle in my first aid kit. The particular model I have is a shoreline marine whistle for two reasons. Firstly, it's essentially a flat whistle. So it takes up much less space in the first aid kit and allows me to carry other important items in there. Secondly, it has a totally different tone to your standard whistle noise. This means that because it sounds different, it might be more likely to attract the attention of people nearby. It certainly gets the attention of my dog well enough. But if you don't have a whistle on you at all, and you're not able to whistle, you can use various items that you might find around you. For example, a beer bottle cap. Just fold your thumbs over the edge, creating a V shape and blow hard down onto the edge of the bottle cap. The same principle can be applied to an acorn shell. Fold your thumbs over the edge, create a V and blow. Both can make a high pitched whistle sound, which could help you get the attention of people nearby. An item which I always keep in my first aid kit is a small signaling mirror. It's so thin that it takes up barely any room in the kit, but it's not always easy to see where you are reflecting the sunlight. And so a better option is this rescue flash signal mirror. This has been specifically designed to allow you to use the viewing hole to see exactly where you are flashing the reflected light. To use it, reflect the light onto your hand or glove. This will show you how intense the reflection is likely to be. Once you have a reflection on your hand, hold the viewing hole to your eye and look at the mirror's reflection on your hand. You will see a bright aiming spot located on the grid inside the aiming hole. Then all you need to do is slowly move the bright spot to the target and this is where the mirror will reflect the light to. Now you can make an SOS signal and know that it has a much higher chance of hitting the search and rescue target than a standard mirror would. It takes a bit of getting used to, but it works really effectively and it's a worthy item to have in the rescue kit. Bright colors are obviously going to help you stand out more than your drab earthy colors. Something as simple as a brightly colored backpack rain cover can really make you stand out especially in dense woodland where it can be quite hard to be spotted. This particular cover isn't for this backpack, but just wrapping it round makes a significant difference to the visibility of the pack. In this shot, I'm wearing earthy looking colors. That's because when I'm in the woods, I normally don't like to wear bright clothing as it often deters wildlife and I find it doesn't suit the environment when I'm filming. However, I will always have something that has high vis colors or reflective material somewhere in my pack. A useful camping item to have is a tarp. It gives you shelter overhead, whilst allowing you plenty of space to move around that you normally wouldn't get from a tent. Most tarps in the bushcraft and survival world are dark, natural colours, so that you blend in more with your surroundings. However, you can get tarps that have a reflective material on one side, and then a green or more natural colour on the other side. These tarps have multiple uses, as the reflective material can also help to direct the heat from a campfire towards you, especially if you have one side pinned down to the forest floor, so that the warmth from the campfire creates thermal radiation, keeping you much warmer. Another item which you can add to your kit to help you be seen more is reflective paracord. This has small pieces of reflective luminous material woven within, which reflects the light back when exposed to torchlight. In addition, because it is luminous, it still glows for 10 to 20 minutes after a bright light has been shined on it. This particular one is also fluorescent orange, which means it stands out really well in daylight too. This all helps when search and rescue teams are out there trying to find your location. I tend to use quite long lengths of cordage for my tarp guy lines. This is so that if I have a need for a more paracord, I can just cut off some from the guy line. This type of reflective paracord isn't just limited to guy lines though. If you cut a small segment off, just a few inches in length, and then feed it through the eyelet of your jacket zip, you can then fold it on itself and tie a knot. Now you have an extended zip pull that will reflect in the dark. Great if you don't like wearing bright clothing, but still want that option of being seen by torchlight if you need to be rescued. You can tie these onto all the zips on your jacket, but also your backpack and tent zips too. If wearing bright clothing or having bright paracord on your tarp and tent guy lines isn't your thing, then you can always pack a small piece of reflective material in your bag. This can serve multiple purposes, 
You can place it under your sleeping bag to help reflect the heat back to your body, but it can also be used to reflect light and signal for help. The material itself tends to pack down pretty small, so you can save on space in your pack. An alternative and more efficient option is a mylar blanket, or a space blanket as they're sometimes known. These lightweight, portable thermal blankets help to reflect the heat back to your body. They come in different sizes and are extremely compact, making it a great option to always keep one on you. They can reflect up to 90% of your body heat and are reusable, waterproof, and they work really well keeping cold wind off your body. They're also easy to use. Simply take them out of the packet, unfold it, and wrap it around yourself, covering as much of your body as possible. The great thing about these is that they are very shiny and the reflective material should make it easier for search and rescue to locate your position. One item that is most likely already on you is a mobile phone. This is one of the most essential pieces of equipment you can have, allowing you to make almost instant communication with family, friends and emergency services. Did you know that there is actually a faster way to contact emergency services than just typing 999 or 911 or whatever your emergency service code is? With an iPhone, if you press the side button on your phone five times in quick succession, it pulls up a quick option to swipe right to call an emergency SOS. This saves time on having to unlock your phone, type your PIN or Face ID, and then have to pull up the keypad and type the numbers in. It works in a similar fashion for Android phones too. However, there may be times when you are deep into the wilderness and you have no phone signal or cell service to contact emergency services. This is where a GPS device comes into its own. For me personally, when I'm on longer trips, I use a Garmin InReach GPS. You can't really go wrong with them. They are reliable and have really good battery life. I use the Explorer Plus version as I like to have the larger screen where I can see the map and surrounding area, but you can get a smaller, more affordable version. These devices are great. You can set them to do live tracking, mark out routes which you can make back at home, send messages and even have preset messages to send to your family or friends to let them know you have arrived at camp safely. They also have a built-in compass which is accurate, you can get updated weather conditions for your location, and they have built-in maps. But some of the features do have an additional subscription fee. But the key feature is the SOS emergency button. When pressed, you wait for the SOS countdown. The device sends a default message to the emergency response service with details about your location. Then you reply to the confirmation message from the emergency response service. Your reply lets them know that you are capable of interacting with them during the rescue. And if you do not reply, the emergency response service will still initiate a rescue. For the first 10 minutes of your rescue, an updated location is sent to the emergency response service every minute. To conserve battery power after the first 10 minutes, an updated location is then sent every 10 minutes. Now, I've covered a number of ways you can signal for search and rescue in daylight, but what about when it is dark at night? The first item you will most likely have in your kit is a head torch. Many of the head torches these days have a built-in SOS function. For my particular head torch, I just need to triple press the power button and it switches automatically to SOS mode. The SOS signal is three fast flashes of the torch, followed by three long flashes, and then three fast flashes again. It's important to try and reach an open area where you can maximize the chance of the light being seen. Other items that I carry also have built-in SOS functions. For example, the camera light that I use for nighttime filming is always in my camera bag. This has multiple different modes, from police, to ambulance, to fire service. But for me, the SOS mode is the most important, and it's a good backup option if my head torch dies on me. Again, I can set this up on my tripod on SOS mode, point it in the direction towards where I think help might come from, and then that frees me up to use my head torch in normal mode so I can pack up my gear and prepare for evacuation from camp or wherever I am based at the time. That's provided I have no significant injury. If your batteries run out of the head torch or other battery operated light sources that you have, you can always use a Sialume light stick or glow stick to help signal for help. These chem lights will give off light when you bend them and snap the small glass vial that is inside the plastic tube. The chemicals inside the glass vial mix together with the chemicals in the plastic tube. This causes a new compound to form and the electrons shoot around the tube and give off light as a result. You can attach some paracord to these and swing them above your head to signal to search and rescue and help them locate your position. These are compact and small 
and I personally keep one in my fire lighting pouch so that it's on my hand should I need it. They last for many hours too, and so can be used to help read maps or as a location beacon to help you find your camp should you move away from it. Another option to help light up your surroundings is a Luminade inflatable solar lantern. These have a small solar panel on the side with a small red light that glows when it's charging by the sunlight and then shines green when it's fully charged. You can carry these on the outside of your pack throughout the day when you are hiking and then at night you can quickly deploy it by inflating it with air and then either hang it in your tent so that your tent can stand out in the dark or hang it in a nearby branch or tree. They give off a surprising amount of light and as they are inflatable they also float too. It's a pretty unique piece of kit and although you might think it's a bit gimmicky it could help you stand out enough to signal for help. Especially if you wave it around in the dark, it becomes much more eye-catching. It might not always be that you are camping or hiking in the wilderness. You might be on a long distance overlanding trip with your vehicle and it breaks down. If there is still power to your vehicle lights, you can turn the high beam on and off using the SOS signal method that we looked at earlier. Three short flashes, followed by three long flashes, and then three short flashes again. If your vehicle has no power at all, then these small road flares are a very useful piece of kit. Now, they're called road flares, and they are not technically a flare. They are basically a battery operated LED flashing light. They have a small hook, which folds into the compartment on the back. This allows you to hang them on nearby trees or on the vehicle. In addition, they have a strong magnet on the back, which allows you to place them almost anywhere on your vehicle. This means that the warning lights can be seen from multiple directions they have multiple modes too, so they can be used for traffic control, a warning light, a rescue beacon, or even recreational activities such as camping and hiking. They even have a white 4 LED light built in so they can be used as a torch. The company claim that in SOS rescue mode, they can last up to 8 hours, but if you have them on quad flash mode, they can last 23 hours, or in steady on low mode, up to 33 hours. They come in packs of three and I always have them in the back of my vehicle in my breakdown kit. You just never know when they might come in useful. And there's just a few tips on how you can signal for help in the wild. Hopefully you never have to use any of these tips, but it's better to have the knowledge and not need to use it than not have the knowledge of it at all. I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch the video. I will try and put links to all the gear that I used in this episode in the description below. If you enjoyed it, feel free to hit the subscribe button. And if you want to watch more like this, then follow the link in the description below to my bushcraft and survival skills playlist, where there are over 20 videos showing you different tips and skills to help you out in the woods. Cheers for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.